May I speak in the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, I learned an important lesson this week. I learned that if you're going to totally abandon scripture and preach about whatever you want, which is what I did last week, it would behoove you to look ahead to the following week and find out what the scripture is going to be so that you're cashing in your chips on the right day. So I finished last week and I had such a great time preaching to you about the bishop election and the singing and then I thought, oh, I should take a look at next week's scripture and start to think about what to preach. <laughs> yeah. And then I read this morning's gospel which really doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense to me uh, and was quite challenging. So, as is my custom often, because if I'm being honest, I'm often challenged by the scripture and I often don't quite understand what it means. I kept going back and reading it and rereading it and rereading it, which I tend to think is a good idea anyway, as you can hear or see something different every time. And finally, I just uh, gave up reading the one portion of scripture that was in our lectionary and decided to go ahead and open the Bible and get an even broader sense of this text, which did help me because this gospel passage comes in the third chapter of Mark. And in the gospel of Mark, Mark dives right in to his description about Jesus's ministry. So in the very first chapter of Mark, he is being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and then immediately the ministry begins. There's no birth narrative, there's no lead up. It is right away, we are in the trenches with Jesus while he is healing people, while he is working on the Sabbath, while he is dining with tax collectors and prostitutes. And this chapter comes right after he has just commissioned his 12 disciples. So a lot has happened in the two short chapters preceding this gospel passage. And so by the time this passage happens, we're seeing that people are just a little bit freaked out. They're not quite sure what to do with Jesus, but they know that he is doing something that's different, and they know that he's doing something that's a little bit scary, and even though they're seeing miracles happen and seeing differences in the lives around them, they're just not sure what to make of it. So, and I love this, this passage begins with Jesus' family coming in and trying to stop him because it's been said to them that he's doing crazy things. And so, of course, and it's always our most beloved family members, right? Who are the quickest to come in and say, all right now, you're acting crazy, you have to stop this. <laughs> They're always the ones that get you, get you going there. And so this is exactly what happens. Jesus' family comes in and they try to stop him because there's all of this resistance and there's all of this fear and there's all of this anxiety about what's going on. And Jesus, because he truly is a wonderful model as a leader, in this passage is pushing through that. Is pushing through everyone's anxiety and saying, folks, what I am doing here is spirit driven. What I am doing here is the will of God and we must continue to pursue this. I think anytime we get a new leader, we're often so excited about how that person is going to bring us into um, our mission work together and is going to lead us into a wonderful direction and then as soon as we realize that that means that our lives don't look like they've always looked we can get a little scared too and so it's so important that those leaders are also able to continue to show us God's will as a community and as individuals now the God's will part that's actually what really stuck out to me at the tail end of this gospel today because Jesus says these words who is my mother and brother Anyone who does the will of God is my mother and brother and sister. Anyone who does the will of God. So I couldn't help but fixate on that a little bit after I'd read the passage about 18 times and gotten through some of the other stuff. <laughs> Anyone who does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He makes it sound kind of easy. But in fact, I think that discerning the will of God and having the courage to follow the will of God are incredibly, incredibly difficult things to do. And so I actually this morning wanted to take just a little bit of time to share with you some of the things that I have learned about discerning God's will and about having the courage to follow God's will. And I hope that it will help you in your lives as individuals and as a community. I tend to think that there's two different ways that we need to be discerning God's will. So the first way I just think is our daily life as Christian people that we wake up every morning and we say to God, thy will be done, thy will be done. That whole prayer that we say together is so powerful, but just that one line 
is the reminder that we need over and over and over again. Thy will be done in every action, in every decision, in every interaction that we have both with our loved ones and with strangers. Inviting God in is so important. Inviting there to be that space for whatever it is that God's will is in that particular moment is a critical part of our Christian lives together. Very easy to forget, because I tend to sometimes think that my will is the better way. But if we offer that space, thy will be done, we can see what is really possible in our lives. The other part about discerning God's will, and this is the one I want to spend a little more time in, is kind of in a, in a bigger what are we doing with our lives, where are we being called to go kind of way. And I think that we do that in community with one another. So you are deciding where St. Thomas's is going to go and how you are going to be a presence in this community. And we do this as individuals. When I was trying to figure out if I was going to be a clergy person, I took a week and I went to the Teze community in France where the monastic community there. Susan uh, was actually supposed to be there this week until the trip was canceled, but uh, lucky for me, she decided to take these Sundays off anyway so I could be with you all, which has been lovely. But I went to the Teze community. I was in my 20s, but I want to say that if there's anything that I've learned, it's that discerning God's will in a big way in our lives happens over and over and over again, regardless of how old we are or what we're doing or where we are in life. And so what I learned that week has actually been really helpful for me in all of these different parts of my life. And it was so good that I want to share it with you. There was a session offered by one of the monks in Teze, and it was exactly on this topic, discerning God's will. And a whole bunch of us showed up for this session, and I think most of us were in our 20s, and all of us were desperately wanting someone to tell us what we were supposed to do with our lives. And the brother that led the session started the session by saying, I'm afraid I can't tell you what to do with your life. And we laughed, and I think we all felt a little disappointed. <laughs> like, really, are you sure? Please just tell us what to do. And he said, but I can tell you that we all have a place in the kingdom of God. We all have a place in the kingdom of God. And our work is to find that place. And then he offered us four different ways that we could help discern whether or not what we were hearing or thinking or figuring out for ourselves was in fact God's will. And those are the four things I want to share with you quickly today. So the first thing he said was that God's will is recurring. God's will is recurring. Not necessarily a one-time thought, not something that you forget about, but something that continues to weave itself into and out of life, be it over a matter of hours or a matter of days or months or even years. I had a minute in college where I thought I should be a gym teacher, even though I had never played a sport in my life. <laughs> but I thought that it was pretty appealing to wear sweatpants every day to work. <laughs> As it turns out, you can also avoid dressing up for work if you're a camp director. So we all end up where we need to be. But um, the gym teacher thing, it became pretty clear to me that that was not necessarily God's will. That was a passing thought for me priesthood came over and over and over again. But I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on those of us who are ordained and are calling because each of you has a calling. And I have no question about that. And your calling is just as important as anyone being called to, to be a clergy person. So your calling will be recurring. The second thing he said is that resistance to your call is natural. Not only natural, but biblical. Every time God calls a prophet or someone to follow him or a leader in our scripture, there is resistance. Moses says, no way, I can't speak. And Jeremiah says, I'm too young. And again and again and again, everyone called to follow has a moment of fear, anxiety, uncertainty about whether or not they can follow God's call. And so when that comes up in you, when you are doing your discernment, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're hearing a no. It means that what God calls us to is often so big that it's easy to get a little bit scared. So don't write off something that you feel is coming to you because of that anxiety. Sometimes, just like Jesus does in this passage today, it's time to push through. The third thing is that other people in your life will confirm your call. Other people will confirm your call. It's why our community is so important. 
It's why we need to know one another and be part of each other's lives. So we can look at each other and say, this is a gift I see in you. This is something I can see you doing. This is a way I can see you making your mark in the world. And we need to listen to those voices that we trust and be encouraged by that and have that help us, help us move forward with whatever our calling is. The fourth and final thing that he said, and it seems like perhaps the most obvious, but it's the one that I always need to revisit, is that God's call brings peace. God's call brings peace. And that one can be a little hard to discern because especially if we're having some of that natural and biblical resistance, it's easy to think that that is not peace. But if you can get beneath that, if you can get past all of the details of whatever it is that you might have to work out to follow God's call, and if you can just think about being present in whatever it is that you're being called to, if the feeling that you are left with is peace, that is a way for you to know that it is truly God's will. So these four things, I have used them over and over and over again in my life. God's call is recurring. Resistance is natural. The people in your life will encourage you and will say the same things to you about what this call is, and it will bring peace. So I want to give you those four things because they have been so helpful to me. And I want to encourage you to be constantly discerning God's call in your life, whatever that might be. And then when you discern that call, to be courageous, to do as Jesus does today and to say to people that are giving you resistance and, as we have said, sometimes your loved ones and your family members will be the first to say, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. But we're family. That's what we do. Being able to step courageously forward despite that and being able to follow that call will be an incredible thing in your lives. And we have seen, because we have answered God's call before, what is possible if we are able to step up and make that happen. We know that resurrection is possible. We know that healing is possible. We know that mission is possible. So please, I encourage you, discern God's will in your life. Have the courage to follow God's will in your life. And then when we say that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we will really mean it. Amen. <laughs>